Near the end of his letter to the Ephesian church, the Apostle Paul wrote concerning the reality of spiritual warfare. Beginning in chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm." Now, it may be helpful for us to pause and remind ourselves of what manner of opposition the church at Ephesus faced. In Acts chapter 19, while on his third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul arrived in Ephesus, the greatest city of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and upon his arrival, he entered into the Jewish synagogue following his mission modus operandi of taking the gospel to the Jews first and then to the Greeks. So Paul spent three months preaching and reasoning and persuading the Jews about the kingdom of God. But when some of the Jews grew stubborn and stiff-necked and voiced opposition to Paul and his gospel, Paul then withdrew from the synagogue and he began to minister among the Gentiles in the hall of Tyrannus. And using that location as his ministry headquarters, Paul spent the next two years evangelizing all over Asia Minor. But his ministry was so fruitful, so successful, that it provoked great opposition. Many were converted from their idolatrous idolatrous practices to faith in Jesus Christ, which began to cut into the profits of those who traded in idols. A man named Demetrius, who was a silversmith, gathered together the local trade guild and convinced them that Paul and his gospel posed a serious threat to their economy and their bottom line. Soon a mob formed and they grabbed Gaius and Aristarchus, two of Paul's companions, and they gathered together in the Ephesian theater, presumably to put these two men to death. It was only when the town clerk warned the mob that they were in danger of provoking the ire of Rome with their rioting, that they were finally quieted and dispersed. It was into that context that the Ephesian church was born. They faced opposition from the Jews, from the pagan Greeks, and from the Roman authorities. Yet less than five years later, when Paul writes his letter to the church at Ephesus, He tells them that neither the Jews nor the Greeks nor the Romans were their true enemies. Their true source of opposition was not flesh and blood, he says, but rather the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He tells them that their true enemies were fallen angels, demonic powers, And these demons do not content themselves with inhabiting the bodies of human beings and causing them to fall on the ground and foam at the mouth. Demons apparently do such things. There is evidence for such activity in the Gospels. For example, the demon who repeatedly threw the boy onto the ground and caused him to foam at the mouth and threw him into the fire and in the water in Mark chapter 9. But in comparison with what Paul seems to be describing in Ephesians chapter 6, such activity seems to be rather puerile. I don't get the sense that the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places that Paul is describing in Ephesians 6 would content themselves with making people levitate and cough up nails. Rather, I think inciting mobs to violence and persecution and stirring up nations to bloodshed and destruction are more up their alley. I'm not denying the reality of individual oppression or possession. Clearly such things did and still do occur. But if the goal of Satan and of those spiritual forces of evil under his command is the destruction of souls, the persecution of the saints, and the prevention of the coming kingdom of God upon the earth, one suspects at least that Satan must think bigger than spinning heads and spider walks. 
Rather than inhabiting and influencing individuals, one suspects that he seeks to inhabit and influence systems and societies. Now, I admit that we're in the realm of speculation when we attempt to examine the nature and the ways of angels and demons. We simply do not have sufficient biblical material to approach anything resembling a comprehensive theology of angelic beings. But every now and then in the biblical text, they appear. And when they do, we've got to deal with them. And that's what we will attempt to do this morning from Daniel chapter 10, which is a chapter that ever so briefly draws back the curtain to allow us to see the spiritual forces behind the movement of nations. Now, before we can get some principles of spiritual warfare that we find in this chapter, we need to first establish the context of Daniel's vision. And we will do so by looking first at the crisis that called forth Daniel's concern. Look with me at verses 1 to 3. Daniel begins, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true. And it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for full, for the full three weeks. The time stamp in verse 1 helps us understand why Daniel was mourning and fasting in verse 3. The third year of the reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia, was 536 B.C. The previous year had seen a wave of Israelites return from Babylon, from their exile in Babylon, to Jerusalem and to Judea. The decree of Cyrus came in 538 B.C., right on time, just as God had promised, as we've seen in Jeremiah 25 and 29. That decree was received by the Israelite exiles with great joy and renewed hope. God has not forsaken His people. God has remembered His covenant. And when they returned to Israel, along with the treasures of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried off into Babylon and Cyrus had sent back with them. They immediately set upon rebuilding the altar of the Lord upon the temple ruins and they reinstituted the regular sacrifices and offerings and the festivals. Six months later, they laid the foundations of a new temple amid much rejoicing, although those who were old enough to remember the previous temple wept at the comparatively meager size of its foundations that sat where Solomon's magnificent temple had once stood. It was not long, however, before opposition arose. We read in the book of Ezra, which recounts the return, the first return of the exiles from Israel, or from Babylon to Israel. We read in Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So these are Gentiles who had been transplanted into the land of Israel some two centuries prior. And in order to understand Zerubbabel's response, we need to remember that God had commanded Israel to be a distinct people, separated from the pagan nations who were around them. In fact, it was their disobedience to that command. It was Israel's propensity to cozy up to the Gentile nations, and more specifically to the Gentile gods, that had led to their eventual exile in the first place. And so with that background in mind, we can understand Zerubbabel's response. Verse 3, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. 
Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. I suspect that news of that opposition in Jerusalem had filtered back to Daniel, who was in Babylon, and that it was this opposition that caused him to fast and to mourn for three weeks. Ian Duguid is an Old Testament scholar and pastor. His commentary on the book of Daniel is excellent. And he brings out an application here that I hadn't thought of, but I think is important and convicting. He asks the question, why does Daniel fast and mourn? It was not a total fast, which was probably wise, as Daniel was in his mid-80s at the time. Rather, Daniel fasted from luxuries such as meat and wine and the expensive oil that would have been soothing in the dry desert climate of Babylon. The fact that Daniel fasted from these things implies that he usually partook of such luxuries. In other words, Daniel's life in Babylon as a high government official was pretty comfortable. It would appear then that Daniel fasted from these things as a physical manifestation of his solidarity with his people who were suffering hundreds of miles to the west. They were not, in other words, out of sight and out of mind. Daniel so identified with them that it did not seem right for them to be suffering opposition amidst the ruins of Jerusalem while he lived in luxury in Babylon. At 85 years old, there was not much that Daniel could do physically in order to help his people, but Daniel could fast and pray. Listen to what Doug Ewood writes on this point. He says, Daniel's solidarity with his brothers and sisters in the Lord, even at a great distance, should be a challenge to us. The, world, the church around the world is one family of God's people. When one suffers... We should all sorrow. When one rejoices, we should all celebrate. This obligation requires that we develop an awareness of what is happening elsewhere in the world. Doing this may be as simple as reading prayer letters and emails from one of the missionary families that our church supports, or as complicated as going on a short-term mission trip to encourage believers in another country. None of us can know what is going on everywhere, but each of us can know what God is doing somewhere in the world. And we can play our part in supporting and encouraging those whom God has called. We should particularly remember the persecuted church. In many parts of the world, there are those who suffer severely for their allegiance to Christ. The writer to the Hebrews urges his readers to remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Of course, in most cases, we cannot write to these people personally to assure them of our support. Nonetheless, we can do what Daniel did, which is to fast for a time from some of the luxuries that are a routine part of our lives and devote ourselves to praying for these persecuted saints in their time of desperate need. It makes sense, doesn't it? Many of us, when we hear the devastating news that fellow church members are suffering. They've been diagnosed with, with a terminal illness or, or a loved one has died suddenly and tragically. We don't feel like celebrating and luxuriating ourselves. Why? Because we so identify with our brothers and sisters in their sufferings. We naturally empathize by fasting and mourning. We take Paul's exhortation in Romans 12, 15 seriously. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But have we ever thought of extending that exhortation to the global church? Would it ever occur to us to fast and pray for the persecuted saints in North Korea or the suffering saints in the Ukraine? The day I wrote this sermon, I read in the Baptist press... Quote, Evangelical Seminary Dean Vitaly Vinogradov was fleeing Russian occupation of Bukha, attempting to walk 10 miles to safety in Kiev 
when Russian forces killed him and left his body on a local street, a close friend and ministry associate told Baptist Press. His body lay on the street beside that of fellow believer and friend, Oleg Grishenko. Do you know what I felt when I read that two of my brothers in Christ had been killed? Nothing. I just continued to sip my coffee, and later that day I wrote this sermon until I came across Doug Hewitt's comments, and it convicted me. Now, we cannot grieve every suffering that befalls the global church. Our hearts simply do not have the capacity. But we can grieve some of them, and we can imitate Daniel in demonstrating solidarity with the global saints by voluntarily and temporarily foregoing some of the luxuries that we routinely enjoy in order that we might fervently and urgently pray for the afflicted church worldwide. We have a tendency to develop such a tunnel vision and becoming so focused upon the members in the ministry of this church that we forget that we are but a very, very small part of the ministry and mission of the global church. God has saints that he loves just as much as he loves you who have nothing this morning and are living under the constant threat of imminent death. And I'm suggesting that what Daniel 10 should hint to us is that that ought to have some impact upon us, rather than just acknowledging it and going on living in the relative luxury that is everywhere around us. So that's the crisis that calls forth Daniel's prayer. Then we look at the prayer that provoked God's response. So when Daniel hears the news of the opposition that Israel is facing to the rebuilding of their temple, he fasts and mourns for three weeks. But he also prays. And before we look at the vision that Daniel sees after 21 days of fasting and mourning, that's verses 4 to 9, a vision which, by the way, so traumatized Daniel that he fainted, verse 9. Let's look at what the angel tells him in verses 10 through 12. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. From, from the, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. There are two issues related to Daniel's prayer that I want to point out before we actually get to the main point of this morning's sermon, which is what this chapter reveals about the spiritual battle taking place behind the scenes of world history. Number one, I want you to note that Daniel's prayer was immediately answered. The angel says to him, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard and I have come because of your words. Now we'll talk in just a moment why the angel was delayed three weeks. But for now, just take note that Daniel's prayer provoked an immediate response from the throne of God. We notice the same phenomenon back in chapter 9. Verse 23, where the angel tells, or where Gabriel tells Daniel, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, the word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. So I want to ask the question, why are Daniel's prayers provoking immediately, immediate responses from God? And pose the question, should we expect the same thing? Well, I can think of three reasons why God is immediately answering Daniel's prayers. Number one, Daniel's prayers are immediately answered because he was greatly loved. This is said twice in Daniel 9.23 and Daniel 10.11. And back in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 23, it is actually given as the explicit reason why Daniel's prayer was answered. 
Daniel 9.23, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you. Why? Because you are greatly loved. You are greatly loved, therefore, as soon as you began to pray, I was sent forth to bring you an answer. God delights to answer the prayers of those whom he greatly loves. Which is good news for us because... God greatly loves us in Christ. Second, Daniel's prayers were immediately answered because, verse 12 of chapter 10, he set his heart to understand and humbled himself before his God. This sincerity and humility, this fervency and urgency were physically demonstrated by Daniel's fasting and mourning. God delights to answer the prayers of those who are serious and urgent about praying. He delights to answer the prayers of those who do not come to him as though he were some sort of cosmic vending machine to dispense whatever they ask, but rather those who come to him seeking understanding into his will and his ways. And then third, Daniel's prayers were immediately answered simply because God sovereignly chose to do so. In other words, I'm not presenting to you this morning a formula for getting your prayers answered. In all things, God remains sovereign and free, and He will answer your prayers when and how He pleases. And this is why Jesus told the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18. Jesus told his disciples a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. You must persist in prayer because sometimes, many times, God pleases or it pleases God to delay his answer to your prayers. The point of that parable is that God desires us to be persistent in prayer when an answer is not immediately forthcoming. Daniel, in other words, could have been greatly loved. He could have set his heart to understand and humbled himself before God and yet received no answer and not been given understanding. Neither Daniel nor us can make any demands upon God as though he owed us something. If it is his will that we remain for a time in the dark as to his ways, he will withhold light. If it is God's will that we remain for a time in suffering, he will withhold rescue. God delights to answer prayers in accordance with his own will and his own timing. So should we expect the same immediately, immediate response from God that Daniel received? My answer is hope for it? Absolutely. For we are in Christ greatly loved as Daniel was. But expect it, no. For often our prayer is for immediate deliverance from some form of suffering, a suffering that God has willed for our good. Tim Keller says, if we knew what God knows, we would want what God wants, and our prayers would always accord with God's will, and therefore would always be answered. But we do not always know what God knows, and therefore we do not often want what God wants, and therefore our prayers often receive from God the answer of no, or not yet. But I do think that there is a principle of prayer to be found in this text, which is that we can increase the effectiveness of our prayers if we set our hearts to understand and humble ourselves before our God. That is if we spend less time asking God for what we want and more time asking God what He wants, our prayers will be more effective and God's response is more immediate. Which brings me to the second issue that arises from Daniel's prayer. This text does not specifically tell us what it was that Daniel prayed for, but I think we can infer it from what is stated. I think we can infer that Daniel's prayer was less about removing the opposition that Israel was facing and therefore relieving Israel's sufferings and more about understanding what God was doing in this opposition that Israel was facing. 
Why is God doing what he does? Why did God bring Israel back from exile, loaded down with treasures no less, only to encounter opposition when they return to the land such that the construction of the temple stops for 20 years until God raises up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to stir up the people of Israel to finish the task? Why does God do this? That Daniel prays for understanding more than he prays for relief from Israel's sufferings, I think is demonstrated in three ways. Number one, the angel makes no mention of any request on Daniel's part for the relief of Israel's sufferings. Daniel may have prayed for that, probably did, but the angel doesn't mention it. Secondly, the angel specifically mentions, however, that Daniel set his heart to understand, verse 12. In other words, it was not primarily deliverance, but understanding that Daniel sought. And then third, the answer the angel gives to Daniel's prayer is designed to make Daniel understand, not that Israel will be delivered from the opposition they face, but that this conflict that they're facing is a picture of the tribulation that they will face for the next 500 years and beyond. Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 belong together in one unit. Daniel chapter 11 is the answer that is promised in Daniel chapter 10. And what we will find next week in Daniel chapter 11 is that Israel faced tribulation after tribulation after tribulation after tribulation. This is the way Daniel himself describes what the angel told him. Look at verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and note this, and it was a great conflict. That's the word that was given to him. It was a word of great conflict, not a word of deliverance. Now, deliverance is promised at the very beginning of Daniel chapter 12, but that's a deliverance that comes at the end of the age. You'll see that next week. The word that is given Daniel in response to Daniel's prayers is conflict is normal for the people of God. And this is my point. If your prayers focus more upon understanding God's will and God's ways and less on deliverance from suffering and tribulation, though it is not wrong to pray for such deliverance, you will find that God will answer your prayer for understanding when His response to your prayer for deliverance would be no, or at least not yet, because He has a good and glorious purpose in your present suffering. So Daniel prays for understanding into God's will and God's ways, and God sends him an immediate answer, and that immediate answer is to the effect that conflict will be normal for the saints of God throughout this age. We'll unpack that next week. Let's move now to the vision that Daniel sees in response to his prayer. It is a vision that is announced by a terrifyingly angelic being. Let's pick up at verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Now, we have a choice to make here. Some read in this description of the being of verses 4 through 9 
And they see in it a Christophany, a, a, an appearance of Christ before his incarnation, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. The primary reason that some see in this heavenly being the appearance of Christ is because John's description of the risen Christ in Revelation chapter 1 draws heavily from the imagery here in Daniel 10 verses 4 through 9. Just listen to John's description of the risen and exalted Christ in Revelation chapter 1. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a two, sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And people will read that description of the risen and exalted Christ in Revelation 1, and they will note that it bears many similarities to this vision here in Daniel chapter 10, and they'll say, so this must be a Christophany, because in Revelation 1, it's clearly Christ. John's response to the vision of the risen Christ is nearly identical to Daniel's response. Both fainted at the sight. And the comfort that is offered by the two heavenly beings is likewise identical. Fear not, for I have come to give you understanding. And so it seems like it's a convincing parallel. And if your Bible, if you have a study Bible in the bottom, it says this is a Christophany. This is a, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. I would say that that's fair. That may be right. But I think there's one major problem with viewing this heavenly being of verses 4 through 9, this heavenly figure who's hovering, it seems, above the Tigris River as a Christophany. Look down at verses 13 and 14. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. It's just simply impossible for me to believe that the omnipotent Son of God would be hindered at all, let alone for 21 days, by the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who is, as we will see in a moment, an evil fallen angel, such that he needed Michael, another angel, to come and deliver him. So because of that, I I can't accept that the heavenly figure in verses 4 through 9 is Christ. Um, So this has led some to regard the figure of... Okay, so they'll look at this and they'll say, all right, so it looks like Christ, but he's hindered, which doesn't seem like Christ. So maybe the figure of verses 4 through 9 and the speaker of verses 10 to 14 are two different figures. The first is the pre-incarnate Son of God. The second is an angel. Uh, That also may be true, but I don't find that an entirely satisfying explanation either because it gives no reason for the appearance of Christ if the angel, in fact, is the one who's going to be speaking the rest of the time. A better solution seems to be to regard the heavenly figure of verses 4 through 9 and the speaker of verses 10 through 14 as one and the same angelic being. And if we look back at Ezekiel chapter 1 and we note the four living creatures there they bear a striking resemblance to the figure of Daniel chapter 10 as well. And I think we have ample evidence to see that this is, in fact, an angel and not Christ. Furthermore, I regard the figure of verses 15 to 21 to be the same angelic being that was seen in verses 4 through 9 and that speaks in verses 10 to 14. I think it's all the same angel. Look at verses 15 to 21. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. 
And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Now, all I would add to this third point, all we're doing in this third point is describing the angel that announces the message. And all I would add to this third point is that clearly encountering an angelic being is a traumatic experience. While there is not an abundance of biblical data on the character and the nature of angels, there is more than enough to conclude that their presence is generally not a comfort to men. They are not cute, they are not cuddly, and they are not under our command. Think of the angelic encounters in the Bible and ask yourselves how many times their presence provoked utter terror in the men and women to whom they revealed themselves in their glory. And then do me a favor and don't put statues of angels in your garden or ceramic angels on your mantle. Why? Yeah, you don't really know what they look like, and unless when you look upon them, you shudder in fear and are tempted to worship them, they're probably not accurate descriptions of the angels of the Bible. So, this is an application It's totally for free. It really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the point of the sermon, but let's just let angels be what they are and do what they do rather than tame them and try to incorporate them into our decor. Okay? Point number four. And the main point of the sermon is what this chapter reveals about the spiritual battle taking place behind the scenes of history. The Apostle Paul wrote once again in Ephesians 6 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In Daniel chapter 10, we are introduced to at least two of these rulers of whom Paul speaks, these authorities, these cosmic powers over the present darkness, these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're introduced to two of them in Daniel chapter 10, as well as two of their angelic counterparts. Look again with me once more at verses 13 and 14. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. The prince of the kingdom of Persia is an evil angelic being, strong enough to detain for 21 days the holy angel whose appearance caused Daniel to faint. Until Michael, whom the angel describes as one of the chief princes, archangels, came to break the stalemate and get that angel through to Daniel. In verse 1 of chapter 11, the angel relates how he himself had previously helped Michael in a similar fashion. Chapter, verse 1 of chapter 11 should probably belong to the end of chapter 10. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. That is Michael. In verses 20 and 21 of chapter 10, the angel speaks of his future orders and his past conflict. He says, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth, and there is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So here we have four angelic beings, Michael, the prince of Israel, we have the prince of Persia, we have the prince of Greece, and we have this angelic messenger who's been sent from heaven to Daniel. Daniel. 
What can we infer from these strange verses about the supernatural battle taking place behind the scenes of human history? I'll conclude this morning by drawing four tentative conclusions and implications from this text. Some are more tentative than others. Number one, there is a spiritual battle being waged in the heavenly places between the holy angels and the evil fallen angels. We don't know what form it takes or how such combat is carried out, but its reality is clear. Not only from here in Daniel chapter 10, not only from Ephesians chapter 6, but also in Revelation chapter 12, where we read, Now war arose in heaven, or in the heavenly places, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And as I will mention momentarily, I think that defeat happened at the cross. I'm giving you my interpretation now, but I think this spiritual battle takes on a different form after the cross and Satan's defeat than it did before, say, in the days of Daniel. Before the cross, like in the days of Daniel, evidently Satan and his angels controlled entire nations and kingdoms. Hence, there is the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. After the cross, Satan is bound such that he is no longer permitted to deceive the nations. Revelation 12, 9 and Revelation 20 and verse 3. And this is precisely why missions is now possible. However, Satan and his angels now direct their wrath against the church. Revelation 12, 17. Which is why Paul exhorts us to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I know what I just said probably raises some questions for you. But you're going to have to come to my Tuesday morning Bible study through the book of Revelation to get answers. Number two. This spiritual battle appears to be waged on an institutional level as well as on an individual level. We are more familiar with Satan's assaults on individuals. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, 1 Peter 5.8. And he has many tools at his disposal, accusation. Revelation 12, 10, the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. Temptation, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. Deception, Acts 5, 3. Despair, there's an interesting one, 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Satan has many tools in his arsenal, many weapons in his, ar- in his arsenal to afflict individuals. Satan and his, the, the, the angelic beings under his command have many weapons at their disposal in order to oppress and afflict individuals. But we are less familiar with Satan's assaults on institutions. If I'm reading Revelation rightly, and I am, Satan also influences political institutions to persecute the church as symbolized by the beast of Revelation. He uses religious institutions to deceive the church, as symbolized by the false prophet. And he uses cultural institutions to seduce the church, as symbolized by the whore of Babylon. I think the reference to figures like the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece remind us that Satan and his angels do not just possess and oppress individuals, they possess and influence institutions, government institutions, social institutions, cultural institutions, religious institutions. Third, the aim of this battle is the extension or prevention of Christ's kingdom. Extension for the holy angels, prevention for the fallen angels. You've got to ask yourself, why does the prince of Persia care about one angelic messenger bringing a message to one Israelite living in exile within his realm? Why struggle against him for 21 days? And the answer is, I think, because Daniel was a prophet of the Most High. Angels, whether holy or fallen, do not know the future. 
So I'm not suggesting that the prince of Persia knew that this angelic messenger was bringing to Daniel what would become Daniel 11 and 12. I don't think he knew that. All I'm suggesting is that he knew that the arrival of a holy angel on the borders of his kingdom could not be good. So he withstood him. And that is the aim of the evil angels in this spiritual battle, the prevention of the kingdom of Christ. Correspondingly, the aim of the holy angels, like this angelic messenger, like Michael, is the extension of Christ's kingdom. Daniel and the rest of the saints, including us, we needed the content of this vision that is recorded for us in Daniel 11 and 12. We need it for our own perseverance. And so these holy angels went to battle in order to get it to us. Now, I'll wager that you didn't consider what it took to get these chapters to you when you opened them up this morning. Fourth, and finally, the outcome of this battle has already been determined by God's decree of predestination and by Christ's death and resurrection. Look again at verses 20 and 21. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. And note this, but I tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. This conversation between the angelic messenger and Daniel occurred in 536 B.C. Persia was firmly in power. So how did this angelic messenger know that the prince of Greece would come? a conquest of Greece over Persia that would not take place for another 200 years. How did he know? Well, we are explicitly told in the vision of the ram and the goat of Daniel chapter 8 that the king of Greece would destroy the king of Persia. But whence comes that certainty? And the answer is given in verse 21. These events are predestined and decreed in the book of truth. This book of truth is a way of speaking of God's decree of predestination by which he ordains all things whatsoever come to pass, including the rise and fall of nations and kingdoms. In other words, there is a real battle going on behind the scenes of human history, but the outcome of that battle has already been determined. All of the details of that battle have already been decreed. And the decisive victory has already been won when Christ died and rose again. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And you, when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And look at this next phrase. At the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. Those rulers and authorities are evil fallen angels. He triumphed over them in Christ. Or Hebrews 2.14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. When and where was Satan and his fallen angelic hordes under his command defeated? At the cross. Much like the Allied invasion on D-Day in 1944 broke the back of the German forces on the Western Front and the Soviet victory at Stalingrad in 1943 broke the back of the German forces on the Eastern Front, yet the war continued amidst heavy casualties on both sides until 1945. Even so, did Christ's death and resurrection break the back of Satan and his forces, yet the war has continued for some 2,000 years. Satan's retreat, so to speak, has been long and bloody. The war is not over, but the victory is certain. The final defeat will come when Christ returns in power and great glory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. 
But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. Same words used in Ephesians 6.12. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. In other words, even though our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against evil angelic powers at work, both on an individual and an institutional level, to destroy and devour souls and prevent the coming of Christ's kingdom, they cannot and they will not prevail. As Charles Wesley wrote, and as we sang this morning, His kingdom cannot fail. He rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Therefore, church, lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. And that, I suggest, is the application and proper response of the church to Daniel chapter 10. Put on the full armor of God. Stand firm in the truth and rejoice in the sure and certain victory which is ours through the finished work of Christ on the cross.